the hardest thing to know is the nature of what this ultimate compression is. The scale. What it means. I mean, it like one way I imagine it, and that's why I love to quote Joyce about man becomes dirigible. I imagine it as the day when your mind becomes your home. You know, and all over the world, people just realize that now their mind is their home. But this, and you, you feel ready to describe that as as the end of history or the end of the universe? Not the end of the universe, the end of history, because I think history is some kind of involvement with matter. It's a wrestling with the angel of matter, and the end of history is when you pin the angel of matter to the mat. And then <laughs> you stand up and you say, I am the Adamic human being made of light, and you leave the realm of matter and return to some previously hidden dimension. Whitehead called these things epochs, these long periods of time, and he called transitions from one to the other a shift of epochs. Well, we've only been doing things like measuring the speed of light since 1910 or something like that. All the so-called constants of our physics are based on minuscule periods of actually monitoring these things to see if they are constants. And so I can imagine it as a, a shift in the laws of the universe that somehow cause consciousness to perceive itself more as it must truly be. And I'm always trying to, to find physical models for these transcendental hallucinations. And the one which fits this is um, a few years ago, this... this Scandinavian astronomer Hans Alfven wrote a book called Worlds and Anti-Worlds, and in it he talked about what's called a vacuum fluctuation. A vacuum fluctuation is where suddenly, out of nothingness, there emerge a stream of particles, and uh, they are equally particles and antiparticles, and they sail along for a period of time, and then they collide again, and each particle is destroyed by its antiparticle, and so what is called parity is conserved, meaning that when you add up all the charges, positive and negative, you get zero. So it's okay that this matter came from nothing and returned to nothing. This violates no laws as long as parity is conserved. But the interesting thing about this phenomenon, which is called a vacuum fluctuation, is that there seems in quantum mechanics no rule which would limit the size of such a phenomenon as this. So it's conceivable that our entire universe is an enormous vacuum fluctuation. And it's just, you know, 10 high 72 particles have emerged from nothingness and are hurtling through space and in another dimension, a parallel dimension, the anti-universe, which is the twin of this universe, is also hurtling through space. And at some point in future time, completely unpredictable from the state given within each universe, the two will collide and all uh, and parity will be conserved and all particles and antiparticles will disappear. However, the interesting thing is that um, photons, which is what light is composed of, do not have antiparticles. They're this one weird exception. So that when the universe collided with its antimatter twin, what would be left would be a universe made only of photons. And those photons would be in the configuration they were in in the moment when the cosmic collapse of the state vector occurred. Well, we have no idea what the physics of a photonic universe would be about. A limiting case or a good first try would be that it would just be nothing and no life and no self-reflection and no mind. But why posit that? There's such a persistence in, in the perennial philosophy of the notion that spiritual development is somehow related to light and, and to the cultivation of inner light and to the creation of light bodies and the stabilizing of light. So uh, 
you know, it's possible to suggest that the that the world of the imagination is simply the world of internal light, that it's a world where light is manipulated by thought in the way that in this world, physical organism manipulates matter. And so that, you know, you live in the radiant castles of the imagination after a shift of epochs in which the, the photonic mode predominated. That's just one way of imagining it. It's one of the richest meditations there is to try to imagine the millennium. Again, it's this thing, what would you have if you could have anything? I mean, sometimes I imagine it, you know, Hieronymus Bosch's great triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights, where men and women of all races mingle among giant wrens and strawberries and feed each other pomegranates under an autumnal sun in an endless rolling park-like world of exotic vegetables and sexual excess and so <laughs> hard stuff to be. Sounds better than the end of the universe. You can really take a readout on yourself by by seeing how would you like things to be. You know, I mean, I have sometimes I my fantasy is. I would like to be alone on a starship 10,000 light years from home with all the books in the universe and I would dress like Captain Ahab and I would stride around the catwalks inside this echoing starship and faithful robot slaves would bring me crumbling volumes of ancient lore which I would you know, say, no, this is a little too Vincent Price. How about... <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I love, uh, if any of you are into science fiction, the science fiction of Cordwainer Smith is really wonderful. And one of his stories, uh, The Starship, is uh, George Washington's estate, Mount Vernon, in New York. And it's all exactly like Mount Vernon in Washington's time, except in the library of the big plantation house, there's one room from which the thing is controlled, and it's actually a starship in mid-flight. More questions about this time theory? Or... Yes, I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> you mentioned here how the now is flooded with future perception. Yes. And I have just, it's really part of the Tibetan uh, practices, but it's always something which captures my imagination. It's just, how come it's now, now? And the, the fact that these future perceptions are so tremendously tangible to us, especially while sitting in meditation or while uh, eating a meal even or something. And there's this, how come it's not yesterday and how come it's not tomorrow? And how come that I'm here now when I just have to flick my mind and I'm in yesterday and equally easy in tomorrow? I wonder if you have anything to say on that one. Well, I think that life proceeds through time. It's an effort by organism to map something one dimension larger than itself. So it takes a whole life to do it. A life is an effort to map a something, you know? And the now is the moving edge of the mapping process. You cannot map it instantly or you would be it. And so what, to, what being in time is is experiencing the incremental mapping of this higher order object. And that's why hopefully a long life would give wisdom because a person would begin to get the whole picture. Oh. You know? So the now is kind of like the edge of the pencil as it moves yeah, over the that's ground. Really much yes, well what did Plato say? That the present is the moving image of eternity. That That's pure good so Platonism. Our well, you can think of it as a, uh, you can think of the now as a kind of uh, laser which is moving over a larger surface and illuminating it, you know, scanning it. It's scanning something and it takes it a while to scan it and then at the end all the data is in place and then you say, oh yes, I see now what the object of cognition was. And we, our faith is, and there's no reason to doubt it, that this is a great 
transcendent experience. This is the resolution, uh, the peace that passeth understanding as you sink into death. It's just that we like to think that the psychedelic experience gives us a preview. No one escapes, you know, the final realization. It's just that some people do postpone it to their last act. But there's no reason for that, because it is the, the mystery, the culmination. It is the date palm and the wellspring. I'd like to... Uh... I'm always interested in pursuing things from the Maya angle, so I'd like to ask about how this theory of time relates to the individual. It's somewhat related to BJ's question. There's some sense I have that um, in their techniques, and certainly you've experienced and other people have experienced this with the mushroom at, at uh, high doses of um, traveling through time and actually seeing the future or seeing the past and I, I was wondering if you could say more about that and, and uh, some framework for understanding how that is possible. Yes, well, I think psilocybin seems to be the great teacher of history and, wants, and, and part of its teaching is history. It views a person without a history as a person with amnesia, you know, a person with a diminished capacity because your history gives you the power of your convictions. Uh, the way I use the wave, or the way I've been using it recently, is to try and study the time immediately ahead of us so that we don't misjudge what's going on. And, to, uh, you know, it's a mathematical process. There's no indeterminacy about it if we anchor the whole wave system on 2012. And what I see from that anchorage, anchorage point is uh, in the 67-year cycle from 1945 to 2012, we have reached that point which resonates with the larger 4,306-year cycle at that point which corresponds to the collapse of the Roman Empire around 475 AD. In other words, uh, we, are, we have been through a period of imperialist expansionism, which has lasted for a number of years, certainly since the beginning of the 80s. But I see a retrenchment of that and a, a, uh, a uh, recidivist tendency, a tendency toward religious fundamentalism, rigid social structures, and in short, the sorts of things which could be seen as valid resonance patterns uh, to the early medieval phase of European civilization. The period from uh, AD 474, let's for shorthand call it 500 AD, the period from 500 AD to 1500 AD, in other words, to the discovery of the New World by Columbus, that thousand-year period is the, is the resonance that we are going to experience from now to the late 90s. Around 1998, we will reach the beginning of the Renaissance and the discovery of the New World. But we are going to have to endure a period not entirely to our liking. We represent the pagan Hellenistic spirit which has held full sway within the empire for the past 25 years. And we may feel constricted now, but I think that our ideas and our position in society has further constriction to undergo before it reflowers uh, downstream a bit. So when I first realized that, I felt very pessimistic. Mm. But then I asked myself, well, what aspects of medieval life uh, could I groove? What aspects of, of that medieval eschatology were solitary to my needs and wishes? And I discovered that, you know, it was an age of great mystical faith and illumination. Mm. It was an age of uh, 
communities of like-minded people seeking transformation mm -hmm. far from the turbulence of the collapse of the empire. So uh, I, I, th I am not of that my theory leads me away from those people in the New Age who think we're about to be catapulted into the corridors of power. I think that's preposterous, and the evidence for it is zero. And uh, I think better we should tend our gardens and uh, form brotherhoods and sisterhoods of affinity and realize that the task of transformation is one of a lifetime our lifetimes, you know? And every time someone like uh, Dick Price or Tony Lilly moves from the wheel, I always wonder, you know, how did it feel to know it wasn't finished? You know, to go with it undone. And... Uh, oh, yes, I have no doubt that when the saucer comes that... Tony or Dick will be in control, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> what is it uh, Bob Dylan says in his song, Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot fighting in the captain's tower? Um, but yes, so, so I don't know if that answered your question, Robin, but I wanted to, to get it in because the real... Uh, the real meat for most people for this idea about time is not the mathematics of it that and the symmetry of it that's only pleasing to a certain mentality but really what does it tell us about the years immediately ahead and what it says is you know consolidation illumination community and uh, self-discipline I can only say thanks a thousand times that we don't have to go through it for a thousand years and only for like 15 years. This acceleration seems to me to be very, very convenient. <laughs> Imagine if we were born in, in 500 AD and we had to look forward to that. Yes, well, that's why I say, you know, imagine the people who lived in times when the temporal river was stagnant or even when countercurrents swept it backwards. This is the anguish of the ancestors. This is the sacred trust that must not be betrayed. The pogroms and the invasions and the atrocities conducted across history can only be somehow redeemed if we, who are the living wavefront of this genetic experience, do not fumble the ball, you know? All our ancestors are watching to see how we will do. Oh. Kat. I would like to address Robin's question as well, because it seemed like you were asking sort of on a more mechanical, how does this happen? Well, yeah, how can it be that, yes. that, uh, that the Mayans or we on psychedelics mm -hmm. can travel through time and, and see these things? My image for it that explains that phenomenon to me, and I've had the same experience past and future, is, well, Terence was just referring to the temporal river, is that it's a river which flows two ways, from the past to the future and from the future to the past. And if you put yourself out in the middle of it, let go of control, let go of fear, and maybe you want to choose your orientation, or maybe you don't. You can just find out where you flow, or you can sort of face the past or face the future and flow there. I mean, this is not a physicist's explanation of how this happens, but it seems to work that way, you know, and that we think perhaps far too much of the past creating the future, and that we should think more, and perhaps other people have, of how it's flowing the other way, and mm -hmm. this is how some so-called primitive people have managed to conserve the very simple, effective beauty of their lifestyle, is, and that, that real strong feeling that every moment is now, because they're thinking of it simultaneously. Mm. I, I think of that, and that, that also sets my mind off, um, you know, uh, that's kind of like the river's flowing both ways, and if you kind of uh, take a, a step to the side somehow, that you'll catch the, the current from the future. That's appealing, but also, I mean, I, I, I always play with these metaphors, and maybe I'm literalizing them too much. Is it possible to step out of that stream in some way, and then looking above and sort of 
choose where you're going to descend into it. Or another image that came to mind is, um, are there somehow um, holes in the fabric of time that you can shoot through, um, sort of like uh, in, in 2001, the Stargate opening up, and um, there's this uh, hole in between, and where you emerge is not the other side of it, but someplace completely different. In the if you take the wave seriously and apply it on these short scales of time, you know, you can find your way into, yes, unique configurations of the moment. It's like astrology in that way, you know. And uh, often the content of a psychedelic experience can be later seen to be because of the situation of historical resonance that you weren't perhaps even aware of at the time. Or, or if there are parallel worlds, one or many, which ones happen to be adjacent at that moment in the cosmic weather, kind of, you know. It's mm -hmm. sort of sometimes mm -hmm. I've taken the mushroom just to say, it, like a, a, a weather person, to say, okay, I just want to see what's happening out there right now, mm -hmm. not with a will in it, you know. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you can find that it's about knitting in your rocking chair, or you can find that you're just on some landscape that you couldn't have conceived <laughs> of before. The, the essence of Tao is the correct apperception of process. That's what Taoism is, is to understand process is to be a Taoist. And I think that this is almost a formal rendering of the notion of Tao, almost an effort to create a, a mathematics, a, an algebra of the Tao. And as long as it's true to the notions which Taoism conserves, which is of flow and determinacy within indeterminacy, uh, it, it serves. This is what understanding time is, is to understand process but to understand it so well that it's like a sense for you. It's like seeing. This is the kind of seeing that is uh, very important, to see into time. It's what history and culture have experimented with, but it's what we now, by identifying that as what is going on, can accelerate uh, much faster.